Before the next episode of XJob Downloaded starts, I have a big favour to ask. If you've enjoyed any of our episodes so far, please can you click on the follow button on your platform. I'm on Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon and YouTube. It costs nothing to follow, but makes a real difference to me as a podcast producer. Thank you. My name is Paul Maleri, and for 30 years I served with Essex Police. During that time, I interviewed suspects for murders, rapes, extortions and violent crimes. Now, I interview former members of the police and military and others who have done exceptional things in their lives. Sit back and listen to X Job Downloaded. This interview is being tape recorded. My name is Paul Maleri and this is X Job Downloaded. And today I'm going to interview Peter Mule. Now, Pete was a member of Essex Police. He transferred to the City of London and went on to serve on the National Crime Squad. Was it the National Crime Squad then, or Cirques, or what, what did they it call it? It was the National Crime Squad then, before the other changes. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. I'm very well. I'm very well, pleased to say. Thank you so much for joining me today. But before we get underway, where did it all begin for Pete, and where were you born, and what was your inspiration to join the police service? Oh, I, uh, I was born in Brentwood. Parents... Uh, Harry and uh, Rose May Moore, and um, I was 1954, I was born, and uh, a very, very early age, uh, half past six in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it was a thunderstorm when apparently my mother said, Harry, the baby's coming. He said, uh, but it's raining outside, which wasn't met very well. <laughs> I told him to go up the village to phone for the midwife. So... Yes, I was born at a very early age and uh, continued through life. I had a good time in Hutton. I was brought up and went on to the uh, local schools there. And uh, leaving school at 15, was I wanted to get away from school as quickly as I could. And uh, the, the exams and things weren't part of my thing at the time then. And I became an uh, apprentice electrician for the electricity board. Oh, did my time with them, became an electrician, approved the electrician, but I got fed up with crawling underneath people's floorboards and things at the time there. And I hankered a bit of a feeling for going into the police for quite some time. I, I don't know why it was. I, I think it was originally sort of military type thing that I was interested in. And my father was vehemently against it, having been called up in the war and messed around there uh, but uh, the police really did appeal to me so I applied to Essex Police and it took at that time nine months to get in nine from months. my application to joining and that to go for the tests and at Chelmsford headquarters there and fill out all the different forms and bits um, and subsequently on the 22nd of December 75 I walked in the door and uh, Starting my police career. 22nd of December, three days before Christmas. Yeah, yeah. I, I was quite surprised. I thought they would have put it off to after Christmas, but no. Uh, a group of us all turned up there on that 22nd of December. And do you know, that there's a it's really bizarre because I joined on the 29th of December, just after Christmas, and you'd have thought they'd wait till the new year. But then yeah, it, was, it, it, yeah. it was explained to me that it was um, down to the budget and, you know, that, that they had a... Surplus of money, and they needed to get people through the door. Ah, oh, interesting. Yeah. So, did you go straight to training school then? We went into training school for a week. I think it was a week. Uh, yeah, just a week or just over. Uh, and then initially, we were supposed to go to Ironsham, and we all clued up for that and heard all the horror stories mm. of Ironsham and the bits there. But uh, then. At the last minute, they said, no, it's all changed. You're going to Ashford now. Oh, wow. You um, must have been one of the first lot at Ashford then. Yeah, yeah. We're very close to. And uh, down to Jolly Ashford, we uh, trudged. And, uh, yes, all the ins and outs down there and the marching around and doing all the uh, little exercises and bits there. Very Fantastic. good. Fantastic. Yeah. How did you find Ashford? I mean, you, you've you've been living at home with your parents. This is 1975, the year that West Ham B 
beat Fulham in the FA Cup. I just want to raise <laughs> that bit. Um, how did you find the initial phases of Ashford? I I found it interesting, a bit strange. I've got to be got to say because I've been out in the world as an electrician doing all the things and bits down there, and then to go into that very close regime when you, where you weren't allowed to go out, you weren't allowed to. Uh, you could go home on at the weekends unless you're on a duty squad, and uh, very restrictive, very restrictive. Mm. And I, I did have a an argument with the um, one of the sergeants at the time. There, when on a parade, I surreptitiously, not too good actually, put my hand up to adjust my uh, chin strap, and this. Uh, <clears throat> Sergeant marched down the uh, parade ground, screaming at me, that man who's lousy, that man who's lousy, and stood face to face, screaming at me. And uh, I told him what I thought of him. And uh, we parted ways. And I thought that was going to be the end of my police career in that spot. Uh, And as I was packing my stuff up, I got asked to go and see the superintendent in charge. And uh, we had a a little discussion there amongst the three of us, and uh, we well, still here, so it worked. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. How did you find the camaraderie there? Because if there was a, a group of Essex people, how many how many of you went down? Oh, I think it was about a dozen of us. Um, we we were great. We had a good time. The the funny bit about being in Essex and joining the police at that time, I I got my first month's money. And it was 127 pounds whilst I was there. And I was like, ah, I sought out the Essex sergeant and said, there's a problem. And he said, well, what's your problem? I said, look, showed him my uh, wage slip. And he said, oh, that's not bad, 127 pounds. So I had uh, my Eastern Electricity Board wage slip still in my pocket, in my wallet. So I took it out and he said, well, it's a bit more than that. I said, yeah, but that one's a weekly one. Oh. And he went, oh, son, you've made a mistake. <laughs> you have. <laughs> yeah, man. I said, I admit there was overtime on it. And a bit, so I said, that was a hit at the time, I remember. It was a, a lot of money I lost on, on the initial bit. But uh, No, the camaraderie was good. Um, the exercises were great. We had a... Um, a drink drive exercise that I remember where the new, one of the new training sergeants there, a lady, um, was taking a sip of sherry with um, before every breathalyzer. But unfortunately, she was drinking the sherry <laughs> every time <laughs> from the peak. So when it came round towards the end of the lesson, she was well and truly polluted. Fantastic. There was no acting anymore. <laughs> Had to carry her off. <laughs> it's a, um, I don't know what it is now. I think it's a leisure centre or, or I think they've made it into accommodation or something yeah, like that. Yeah, there's something like that. Yeah. 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 Do you still keep in touch with any of the people that you joined with? Oh, yeah. I, um, Mick Woods, uh, there's a few, quite a few people with, around that I still see a part of the VG retired friends and that type of thing. Yeah. So a group there. And, uh, yeah, those early days, um, Mick Woods, uh, he's, uh, done a, a lot of stuff as well. And the people I then linked up with at Colchester. Yeah. Great times in Essex. And so was Colchester yeah. your first posting? Colchester was my first posting. Oh, what a brilliant place it was. Yeah. Uh, you had the locals, you had the military. It had a good cross-section of people, I would say, sort of from the highest in the land, or most of the lowest of the low, mm. and that gave you a, a real good time there. Though the schooling wasn't great. I got a, the, the There were good schools, but the, the big thing was, I think it was Philip Morant School. Yeah the one to get into for children and uh they had they had a, i think it was a three strike rule you do two things wrong go a third time you were thrown out anyway uh, it, that was it it's funny isn't it because culture in 1975 the the army were very prevalent the students yes. were equally prevalent because they they'd had um all sorts of issues up there with the with the left wing and they've been student 
riots and God knows what else. So it's quite, it's a very diverse town and even more so now. What do you remember about the old Colchester police station? Queen Street? Yeah. A lovely police station. It was a lovely police station. The, well, one, an, an excellent shift, a shift at Colchester. We were in there. And the my very first bit when I got posted there was it was, um, I was welcomed and here's the backyard. And I had to go out my entire shift for many, many shifts was to look at the backyard gate. So I was security for the backyard because the IRA doing their thing at the time yeah. there. And I think I could draw you now, even now, those pale blue gates, I could draw you the knot holes and the bits and things. And, um, and yeah, go on and, and I, 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 yes, I've got to be honest and think, why did I join? <laughs> I looked at these gates, letting people in and out. And there was a superintendent marshal, uh, I think his name there, Peter Marshall, seems to ring a bell. And he came in one day in half blues and I stopped him and he said, I'm superintendent marshal. I'm sorry, it's marshal. And uh, I said, fine, ID, went through all the things there. He said, don't you know I'm now? And I'm not ID uh, and stuck with it. And he produced his warrant and great, that was it. And he came. Ten minutes later, he came out, full uniform, said, go in, have a cup of tea. I'm taking over from you. Well done. Fantastic. He really was good. Absolutely marvellous. As against, and I'm not having to go to chat by any, so uh, Chief Superintendent Dighton, oh, yeah. I had met, Digger Dighton, as he was yeah. known. Um, he, great guy. My locker was in the corridor, along with many others, because uh, the station was full. And this chap in civvies came past me at the end of the day, uh, changing. I said hello, and I said, hello, mate, all right. And uh, he probably went to about 35,000 feet. So <laughs> <simple>. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was sort of looking at him and said, what's that about? And uh, he turned out he was the chief superintendent that I hadn't met. So he promptly tore into the uh, sergeants, uh, Brian Legan and John Rose. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, uh, because I didn't know them, but oh, no, they were, it wasn't fair because they didn't know I'd met him and didn't no. know he was. I was just being friendly, but uh, we well, got over it. <laughs> so they were your skippers. Who was your inspector at Colchester then? We did uh, Inspector Chidwick. It was uh, and then Bob Goodall. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because his daughter went on to join the join Essex, Lynn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so they were the the controllers, so to speak. And we had a good number of people on shift. We had two area cars, I think it was four pandas, plus the walking beats as well, the detached beats. That was a good number of people going out every day from there. You, and then you My dad had left I would imagine my dad my dad left there in seventy five. Um my abiding memory of Colchester Police Station from a from a child and when I joined, was the smell. There was, seemed to be a, a smell of bleach and is when you went in, yeah. into the into the front. And certainly my later later life, Alf Smart was the property officer there. And I just I've just got so many fond memories of Queen Street Police Station. Oh, it was a brilliant, brilliant location. Uh at the back end you well, you had a sort of parade room in the middle and then the Clayton was the back and then the front there with the control room and the front office and uh, Ted Hart, the station sergeant, Bert Turner. Bert Turner, Bert Turner yeah. The station sergeant there. A little interview room at the front uh, as well. And then the inspector's office up on the same floor as the Copper Pop, the, the bar. where we had to have our fortnightly... Uh, law lessons, um, and I can't think of the sergeant who came round from the training school was uh, would screw his fist up and say, oh, "I'm pounding it into you. I'll beat this lodge into you." <laughs> and, 
a character of the first degree and Bert Turner looked after the snooker tables on the top floor. Yeah, and they were good snooker tables as well. Both very good. <laughs> You're under pain of death if you did anything wrong in yeah, there. Absolutely. <laughs> Who was on CID there? Do you remember? Um, you had Ricky Wyatt, Chief Inspector, Detective Chief Inspector Rick Wyatt, and John Garrard. D.I. Garrard. Yeah, John Garrard, yeah. Yeah. Bloody hell. No, because I joined, I did my two years, just just over two years, and then I, I went to CID uh, for a period of time. CID at Colchester? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it was Mick, Mick Lewis there then, and... Um, yeah, yeah. Mick Lewis, Peter Mick Lewis, Wood, Pete points in. Peter point in, Peter Woodcock. Joe Freeman. Joe Freeman. He was a military police with my dad. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, Mountain Scott, was he still there then? Yeah, yeah Scotty. Um, uh, Pete, Pete Tanner. Peter Tanner. Tanner. I haven't He's seen... a wordsmith. Yeah, he is. He, that, that, he, he was really funny because he would put in um, a file, the A57, with some of the longest words going. You knew when Peter put a file in because... Ricky White would actually slam his door. Tanner! <laughs> and he had to look up. We were picking up the dictionary. He was looking up everything. <laughs> Tanner and Spinty. <laughs> How funny. Yeah, because Pete went on to, I think he qualified as a barrister. I believe he did, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny because, as I say, a lot of these, a lot of the names featured in my childhood because they were mates of my dad's, you see. So, But, but they'd come round to our house, because we, we lived in the police commune in Straight Road in Stanway, which is now Winstreet Road. And then we moved out to La De La Haye, so they'd, they'd come round and they'd have a, have a drink or whatever. And it, I mean, it was, di- it was different. And the CID Mini, oh, I remember about Colstow's, the CID Mini, the seat used to be sloped really back so if they arrested any it, it just i don't know why but I, I, I but i do remember sitting in there and the, yeah. the seat was going back una francis was she there then yes yeah yeah, yeah lovely you, you're bringing up names i've forgotten about yeah yeah, yeah. And, oh the, the the when i just before the city uh going on to see i did well i uh i did my standard driving course and they had a ruling at the time that police officers had to wear hats whilst driving. And I've I've got round here somewhere um, the report that John Rose did saying that I sat in the car whilst driving, my head was scraping the ceiling as it was. And could I be excused wearing headgear? And Digger Dighton sent back yeah, approved. <laughs> <laughs> I was excused headgear whilst driving police vehicles. Oh brilliant. And and because you you had some interesting times in Colston then, because as you quite rightly said earlier on, the IRA were in full swing. So, and the soldiers were very present in the town. You know, they'd, they'd walk around in their uniforms and I'm not sure whether that happens so much now. But did you ever encounter any issues in, the, in Colchester at that time? We had a great time because we worked with the 156 Provo and... Uh, when we went out on patrol, as like everyone, you start on the beat. And when I was out on the town, it was generally uh, one police officer with one um, provo officer, um, uh, one of the military policemen. So one of one. So when we we're out in the evenings and nights, uh, we could deal with a series of the um, squaddies and it was a good teamwork thing. I must admit, it really worked well. Yeah, different different era because I mean there was no CCTV or uh, anything like well, that, funny, <laughs> <laughs> and no nobody with a bloody phone sticking up the, up your nose because you've grabbed hold of someone by the collar. And uh, yeah, it, it, but as I say, Colchester was a was a great place. Had the um, the fire at Woolworths taken place then? By then, when you got there? yes, it had to be yeah. before. Yeah, that was before my bit. People told me about it, but. Uh, yeah, that, that's no, that, big that's news then. But we, as I say, generally, a lot of town patrols, and I did a lot of town patrols with, with Keith Beechner. Yeah, uh, yeah, we we were out and about on the time, and Mick Jones was the other person that uh, 
deal on patrol, town patrols, and you were forbidden to actually meet up. You were supposed to uh, patrol on your own when you went out there, but we always met. Yeah, night, of course. Night, night, night. Everyone did, and got a lot more done because of it at that time. But in and out and turnovers and checking people and doing things. And I did get called back one morning because um, a shop on my beat had been broken into and I was in bed on nights. So they'd be discovered later and I got called in to explain why it had been broken into. And I thought, oh, it was, I checked it. That's all I can say. I shook hands with much, so many door handles at that time. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, you couldn't explain that to somebody now about shaking hands, you know, shaking door handles and going around the back alleys and looking for all the all the different things. And because Colchester then, that's before uh, Red Lion Walk was was built, so you had it was it was a much older, yes, very old quaint area, market there. town. Um, one that sticks out, Green's Fish Shop was up that way. As, uh, as well with the the, uh, the general shellfish um, smell pervading yeah. through the area and that, yeah. that time. Of mixing. But it was all sort of rickety. I, if you shook it really hard, they would open up anyway, lots yeah. of these yeah, places. There's no real security. No. So how long were you on CID at Colchester? I did two years on CID at Colchester. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed myself. But at the time... Uh, I was due to go away on the CID course. And, and honestly, I couldn't afford it. It was one of those times when guys were actually taking out extra mortgages and loans to go on the course because you had to be seen to be drinking and being part of the culture mm. a bit. And I'd uh, obviously married and I had two young children as well. And I couldn't afford it. And But at the same time, I still, I was, um, I had my firearm certificate and I'd always been interested in the tactical firearms group. So I think, so I decided, can't afford that. It's not, not going to be for me. And I'd like to go to the support unit. And I transferred off of um, CID and went to the support unit. Uh, much to uh, Ricky White's chagrin, he, he said, well, look, um, you can't leave CID. Was, well, I'm going to. I, I, that's my decision. So, well, you can go to Braintree. You know, the quality of crime isn't so good, but at least you'll still be on CID. <laughs> said, no, no, no it's, it's not happening. I just can't afford it. So that was it. And where did you uh, live was, then? I lived at Stanway then. I had three police houses. Uh, sorry, two police houses in my own. I had three houses in three years it was a uh, munnings road harvey crescent and then bought my own place at coral and walk yeah harvey harvey crescent a lot of um a lot of former police officers still live around there they bought their places and uh they moved in it yeah so did you move police house to chelmsford when you went on the support unit no i had my own house at coral and walk uh and then I was going backwards and forwards to Chelmsford and very much, a, a again, a financial decision. It seemed silly to be putting few, uh, money into the exhaust pipe when I could buy a house in Chelmsford and shorten the journey. So we bought in uh, Old Springfield, half a mile from headquarters, and I just walked to work from there on in. So that was my decision, and I'm still here. So what year did you go to the support unit? 82, that must have been, yeah, 81, 82. So yeah. That, it was after the Ramsey, uh, Paul Howe incident. Just. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So, and um, where Frank Ruggles, uh, my uncle Kev, was my uncle Kevin on there then, on the support unit already? Yes. He was, he yeah, was. yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah. was, yeah. He, he yeah. won't remember. You'll probably remember that more than he does. The support unit in 82, that was a very busy place, wasn't it? Because you were getting ready for a number of things. You had the minor strike on the horizon. Yeah. Um, did you have to go? Were you deployed on the minor strike? I spent nine months in Nottingham and around. Did you? On the minor strike. Yeah. 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 Backwards and forwards each week. Yeah, nine months of that year I was there. Doing the bits there. 
And, uh, what colouries did you go to? I bought my first colour telly, that did. <laughs> Sorry? I bought my first colour telly. <laughs> did you really? How funny. Yeah, yeah well, because that, that was, um, it was very lucrative. Colours. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, and I still say I was owed money. I'm still owed money from that. Oh, yeah. We, on our first um, deployment there, they put us on 15 minute standby and said, you've got, you've got to stay and you can't go off. That's it. You'll be paid. And they never did pay us. <laughs> <laughs> they never did pay us. <laughs> it was denials later. Uh, even though we had the paperwork saying that you were on 15 minutes now, like, no, never happened. Oh, never happened. Who was the um, who was the governor on the official? John Rhymes. Johnny Rhymes, yeah. John Rhymes, absolute uh, excellent, great guy. Well, uh, the whole unit was a uh, an excellent place to be. Uh, wonderful characters and uh, continuous banter. I suppose you call it there. What was it like being deployed to Nottinghamshire? As a group, you know, you've, you've gone as a serial up there. But what was that we, like? What were the conditions like up there? Well, the conditions initially um, were very strange because you had Proteus we were billeted at, which is an old army camp, which had been mothballed for many years. And um, Essex and all one other forces suddenly deployed there. And we had a big old pot belly boiler in the middle of the barrack room. And from that, uh, we had a bucket of coal and had to get that going and we managed to sort that one out and sent out the guys. We got extra coal uh, in baskets and uh, litter bins and things. And this thing took a while to get going, but we kept it in. And when you got deployed, it came back from the end of your shift bit. And depends where your bed was in relation to the uh, pot belly boiler, which is in the middle of the room, as I say, you had dry beds and there were varying levels of steam going out towards the end of the room as the beds were driving, drying out there, the palaces oh, wow. and bits, as they call them. Uh, yeah, it was, it was strange. Food was great, absolutely. But camaraderie, we've been training for a while. You had Les Blythe and a few others, um, uh, quite a few guys had been in the military and knew time in Ireland anyway. And they, there was a thing of Essex initially, I remember doing riot training, which involved tennis balls being thrown at shields. And they said, and they said no, 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 come on, let's, let's do this and do it properly. So we trained very hard uh, and we used uh, bricks, bottles, made our own um, Molotov cocktails and threw them at each other and all the bits there. Played for real. And subsequently, we were a very tight, very, very good unit and relied on each other. You knew you could rely on the guy next to you. There, there was no thinking about, oh, I wonder if you You knew that those people around you were good. And we just enjoyed ourselves. So that just sort of rolled out into from the training ground, the van, onto deployment. We just worked as a cohesive team. What PPE did you have at that time? I mean, with shields, fireproof? We had shields, short shim pads, and, uh, yeah, and the helmets. Um, yeah, with the, those um, crash helmets with a visor, reasonably thick, but that was it. That was it. But we, in fact, the first deployments on the ground was just uniform. We were second row. I can remember being at Orgreave on the second row uh, between us and the um, the miners, and a big crush grain on, and that we we were told to link hands, and it was you had to link with the other person around, uh, and you were crushed. You you were pinned. Your arms went, and. I think to a man, every one of us said, uh, excuse me swearing, but sod that, we're not linking arms again. Mm. You, you're too trapped. And uh, that 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 was an interest. But there was no protection there. That was ordinary custodian helmets and uh, just being on the line. It was only later that we got the kit out, you're in the other stuff, uh, when we're riding around. And 
um, Upper Parliament Street. I remember we'd been sent there. They held us back because we were a very good unit. They, they would say, oh, we'll keep you back in case of any deployment. And Upper Parliament Street, we were allowed to actually go and radio call. Yes, it's clear. Go and check it. And there's no within moments of entering Upper Parliament Street, the hordes came over the hill. It was just a mass of people throwing bottles, firing a crossbow at us and doing things. Wow. Uh, and we did drag on the helmets pretty quick then to get out. Yeah, I bet you did. That's <laughs> quite it's quite intimidating, isn't it, to say the very least? It, it was. We, we lost every window in, I would say, less than 10 seconds on, on that one. So, wow. And then the old the old bottles, the Corona bottles. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, that's a hard glass. That smashed, that cut the actual skin of the van when it smashed against the van at the time. Bloody hell smells. That's quite frightening, isn't it, really? I mean, and but the news was different then as well, wasn't it? It wasn't instant gratification. So you'd pick up no. what, what was going on at the conclusion of the day, you know, the 6 o'clock news, the 10 o'clock news. It wouldn't be... As it happened, no, oh no, no, it was much later, and, and they were great back at the um, back at the station. We got out. The, the funny thing, I forget who was driving now, but we we got. He, he went to even though we're getting battered, he stopped for the red traffic light. <laughs> and, uh, That's hilarious. <laughs> we. Uh, we were, we shouted words of encouragement. To yeah, I bet you did. <laughs> get out of there rather yeah. rapidly. But as soon as we got back to the station, it was right. Like, get yourself uh, a couple and a bite to eat. And they had old oh, teams of window replacement companies there. And within half an hour, all the windows have been replaced wow. in the vehicle. But we were back out again. That's bizarre. Yeah, they, they 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 were set up for it, so they'd learn from their early excursions or uh, yeah. And of course, on the support unit, you'd have been trained. Uh, I mean, if you're in, into your firearms and you're part and parcel, but you'd have been trained in the use of firearms on there. Yeah, well, I I was uh, uh, already a tra trained on firearms before I went, and then uh, whilst there, I transferred onto TFG and then onto the. Uh, firearms training oh i see and what weapons would you've used then oh, we were using 38s at the time initially uh and then you had the, the shotguns um bike or something to remember cyber sides right we used and then it, it progressed later to the semi-automatics and then onto pump action shotguns what sort of incidents did you get involved in as a firearms team I was a firearm, so we, we had a number of um, incidents. We went out to to do ambushes, uh, to do dig outs early morning and that type of thing, um, assisting other forces as well. Um, yeah, arm checks down at Colchester all round, all that place. One of, one of the ones that um, we did an operation at Brentwood where – we saw we were all armed and I was driving at the time and uh, going down the Ingrave Road, Brentwood. Yep. Or a car which was crawling along with the, the back end scraping uh, on the on the ground almost and we pulled that up and uh, it turned out to be Fatima Whitbread. <laughs> who'd been to Nissan's at... Hutton, the trampoline people, had sponsored her and given her a whole heap of weights. And she said, oh, well, I'll take them now. A good athlete, that was it. <laughs> Seize the opportunity yeah. in case they changed mind. So she filled up a car with weights and everything there. And uh, she signed Bill Bishop's um, hat. Well, so, I never. Yeah, yeah, she signed his, the sweatband on the inside of his hat because that's all he had available at the time there. Wow. A silly little thing, yeah. Were you on duty the day that Bill was shot? No, no. Um, and I did regret that but uh, because you, 
it sounds strange to say you wanted to be there. I wasn't, I could tell you exactly where I was. I was on the radio road, Hutton, by the shops, and it came on the radio. Mm. And uh, car radio, I just couldn't believe it, you know, like everyone else. Um, it was uh, a horrible time. Yeah. And, uh, but, the professionalism of the unit, even though it rocked us all, the I think it was the next day or two days later, we were out on another operation and everyone was spot on. We, we were searching some woods for a, an armed robber by um, Northwield Airfield near to there. And I remember there was suddenly stumbling and we thought we we had the person and I challenged, I read along with a couple of others, we, we challenged this uh, movement. Uh, oh, please stay where you are. That was it. I got the shotguns up, looking, that was it. And it was a deer. Hmm. A deer just stumbled out. <laughs> that deer didn't know how close he came. <laughs> <laughs> to being dinner. Go, go. <laughs> Out of there. Yeah, that was a, that was a sad day. My dad was, had been on shift with Bill, and, and I still keep in touch with their son. But yeah, was, that was a very sad day. Yeah, yeah. And I think Merv, you know, Merv Fairweather doesn't get mentioned very often in all of this, but another very very nice man. It was. Uh, I was with him at Colchester, and uh, yeah, great great guy, Merv Fairweather. We had we had some great times. Just working together initially and yeah. doing a bit of yeah. time for him. Yeah, good, good guy. What was the inspiration to go from Essex to the City of London, though? Um, that was really doing VIP protection. I was teaching it as part of uh, the team uh, at Essex, but we didn't have that many uh, operations where we went out. The special branch were doing a few bits there, and I wanted to do a bit more, so... I put in to go to the city. This, it was the city on the map, and the map was very much you could end up anywhere in the map posted, and I didn't want yeah. to move house at all. Whereas the city, those a square mile, they were going everywhere. Yeah. At that time, it's, it's a lot tighter now, but they were going everywhere, all over the place, and I could stay where I was. So, so that was it. I decided, and uh, I, to be honest, I followed a, a guy called Chris Cornell. I don't even yeah. know of him. Um, Chris, been friends with him for many, many years, and uh, he'd already transferred up there and said, "You're getting well. You'll enjoy it here." And and they're going everywhere. They're doing what you want. So I said, "All right, okay." Uh, and that was my move to go to the city. Uh, was for the VIP protection thing. Um, on arriving there, they said, well, well, you might not ever get onto firearms. I thought, yeah, okay, you would, you would have accepted me otherwise in, in that statement because it's just foolish. But within, I think it was seven months, I was on the firearms team and doing the work there. But the city was like going back in time. My heart would always be in Essex. I've got to say, Essex was, it was, is my force. But going into the city, it, it was crazy. It was absolutely, the, the old books were out and they, they were printing off things and papers and sticking them in there. And you had to read these. And uh, only the sergeant was allowed to operate the line in toxometer and things like that. Uh, oh, and, and uh, was introduced to um, recording interviews. And I said, well, I've been doing that for years. <laughs> so they were proud we've got a new machine. <laughs> <laughs> How funny. What, what year was that that you went there? Oh, you got me. Um, oh, five. <sighs> what was it, 13 years, didn't I? So, so it's... 88. Yeah, something like that, 88, 89. Yeah. 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 But the city was, was busy as well, wasn't it? I mean, again, it's another place that was targeted on a number of occasions by the RA. It was indeed. And uh, I was I was out with uh, a guy named Dave Jackson, and 
we were searching. The coded warning came in. Uh, we're in Bishop's Gate and searching for bombs. Why were we searching for Unbelievable, isn't it? You're looking through And literally, six, literally, yeah, we have about. I suppose uh, six, nine feet away from me, Dave um, suddenly goes, Pete, Pete, Pete. Pe. <laughs> uh, and I said, what, what, what you got? He's got a large carrier bag and in he goes, what, what is it? <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a bomb. <laughs> and uh, that was it. We shut down the area quickly and made uh, big strides out of the area. And waited for uh, Ato to turn up to go and deal with it. But it was a, a live unit. A fireball device. Yeah, yeah. So you, But you got onto your firearm stuff and you got onto your VIP protection. What VIPs did you yeah. have to look after then? I, I looked after most of the royal family, visiting heads of state. Um, King Hussein of Jordan came across there. Um the um, oh, I which, uh, president it wasn't it? Reagan, I think it was. It came across, and uh, yeah, quite a number of people. Um, trying to think, there few law lords. It, it just became a continuous thing. They're always looking after someone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I don't like you say. I don't think that they get the opportunity now, in the same way no. that um, the same way that other people do or other other um, organisations. I think the Met take the, the lion's share, certainly in London. They do. And, and, and to be fair, I mean, when it came to the Royal Family, the, the Met were the lead on yeah. it. Uh, uh, but they would hand over uh, at that time, which, which was great. Yeah. Absolutely marvellous. Uh, the, the, the one, the Queen Mother, it was a, a great thing. Um, I was looking after the Queen Mother and uh, with another chap, and we were at the Fishmongers Hall. She'd been to a function there, and she was getting on, and uh, it came to leave at the time, and she got to there's I think it's three or four steps going down as you come from the main foyer down to leave, and she just stopped, overlapped her hands together, tucked her elbows into the side and said, gentlemen, and with that, we stood either side of a picture up by elbows, took her down the <laughs> steps and put her down again. <laughs> How brilliant. And she just said, thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> that was How it. brilliant. Yeah, it and because the Fishmongers Hall is where the uh, terrorist attack took place with the Nile. That's right. Uh, yeah. Tusk. Yeah. Uh, and another time she had, uh, she attended a celebratory function at Smithfield Meat Market. They held a big... Um, party for her there. I think it must have been her birthday. And she holds, it's still held for her, uh, number one bummery, which is the meat porter. Uh, she, They gave her the honorary position right. number one. And uh, there, there were some honey monsters. That's all you can tell. These guys, I don't think they even cooked their meat. They just ate raw meat. They were huge <laughs> meat porters there. And they said, uh, why are you here? <laughs> well, we're looking after the Queen Mum. So they said, yeah, we're just mingling. And they said, no one's going to hurt her here. <laughs> <laughs> and they won't get out if they try. <laughs> <laughs> How funny. <laughs> yeah, it's, and that Smithfield's going, isn't it? They're, they're going to turn it yeah. into a Museum of London or part yeah. of the Museum of London. Yeah. What were the what were the low lights? I mean, you've you've spoken about the, the 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 good times, but there must have been hard times. You know, the the death of Bill Bishop in Essex is probably right up there. But and money was different then, wasn't it? I mean, when you first joined, a milkman was earning, as you quite rightly say, you were earning more as an electrician than you were as a PC. But yeah, what you know, what were the tough times in in policing? Um. Well, you're quite right to say. I think one tough time, which I got early on, we we had a. I think it was a time when you couldn't. You felt you couldn't trust someone. That was when I found out about, we had a lad on shift at Colchester who was stealing, and you thought, how you know someone you thought was a real great guy, yeah, and all of a sudden that the, the professional standards 
of that they had set him up and found out he was stealing property from the property store and all things like that. And, uh, uh, and I think that was the shock at the time, that type of thing. Um, other things, I, uh, just odd deaths of colleagues. I, I think that there was, uh, I had such a good time. Uh, people say, would I join again? Yes, I joined again in a heartbeat. I loved it. I loved my time. Yeah. And you, you got crazies down at, uh, on the support unit uh, with Aid Smart, a bus driver was attacked. We were in the area. We deployed and searched the area because he'd run off. Paid, um, he'd leathered the driver a few times there. I'm not sure if he broke his nose. But we, we went out, bomb burst out, searching the area. Aid Smart and myself were down an uh, side street. Aid had gone down further down the street. No, nothing. That was it. No, I, I just shouted, Oi, come here. I don't know why I shouted like that, but I just said, Oi, come here. And with that, this guy that we wanted climbed out from underneath the car and said, I didn't think you could see me. I went, Oh, there's no good hiding from us. <laughs> just grabbed him. You're under arrest. And Aid's going, stood behind him with his hands going, How? <laughs> One funny, it goes on good times. Yeah, yeah, and I think the good times do outweigh, and and actually, they shroud the bad times, don't they? They do, because as I say, the yes, you you got awkward things with the um, fights a bit. Um, Graham Lumley being attacked at Colchester uh, by a squad and get his nose broken. You thought, what was going on? Because there were times when generally. If someone had had enough, either side stopped. Yeah. Whether it was a, whether it was us as the police or whether it was the villains, whatever. If someone had enough, they've had enough. That was it. Whereas today, they they just want to beat the living daylights out of someone to kill them. Yeah, and and the, the the fact is that the police are the perpetual targets, aren't they? Whether it be via social media or physical attacks, the police are getting it bad at the moment. And, you know, what what you said there about somebody stealing at Colchester, they do walk amongst us. There are people there that do it. Yeah. But I'm heartened by the fact that they're few and far between. You know, you get let down by people that you work with and people that you trust. I mean, we, we had a guy that got arrested for having um, suspected child pornography. You know, and that's yeah. when you're on a team and you get that, you, you feel really let down. Or when you, yeah, when you, when your colleague gets locked up because he was part and parcel of a, an arson attack on your mates, you know, he had, he had working knowledge of that taking place. That really hurts. But there are very, very few people like that. But those that are get exposed and quite rightly so. Yeah, yeah. When you're in the city, what is the acceptance like? of the officers in the City of London as a transferee? Because, I mean, the city are renowned for their red squirrel, grey squirrel behaviour. You know, if you're a red squirrel, you're a pure blood. And if you're a... Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, very much. That was so incestuous. It really was. Yeah, and it, and it, it became a game, I, th- I think, more than anything, um, because there was so much... It was, you know father to son passing down the generations they could go back they could trace uh, their lineage through the uh, yeah how many been in there but we we were bringing in lots of information they couldn't handle uh, they wouldn't have developed if it hadn't been for the dirty transferee coming in uh, really <laughs> given the information yeah it, it, it was crazy and we were trusted in their own way so the they wanted our they wanted our information. They wanted our experience to bring up their own. So that though a lot of people, I my very first bit, the inspector said to me, "I'm glad you're on uh, the shift there. If you can just help us on X, Y, and Z, uh, and that that's the way it went. They recognised they needed the help that they wouldn't get elsewhere. Yeah, they didn't have the knowledge base. No, Barry Tarbin there then. Yes. Oh. Oh, God, now you're dragging out a name. Yeah, you know, we've been working with him on a uh, murder investigation in Essex, but yeah. Yeah, well, he, yeah, because he was in Essex and then he went up there. I think, did Tom Dickinson go to the city of London as well? Yes. Tom Dickinson, Andy O'Dell. Yeah, a few made that made that journey. 
few jumped a little bit. Some did it for um, uh, just so they could climb the ranks. Oh, know, yeah, absolutely. Bit, you know, there are bits there, but I was happy in my bit and doing my thing there. Yeah, yeah. absolutely right. What year did you conclude your police service? I did it in 2005, uh, and I packed in. But before that, I was I was lucky in that if I go back even yeah, further yeah, yeah. to the support unit time, uh, the guy on the unit, Muff Coates, yeah. uh, uh, his other half at the time was a librarian, and the library she was at, was closing down and they were skipping books. They were throwing them in skips rather than relocating them away. And he said, are there any books you want? And that was globally to anyone on the unit, anything you want. And I was interested in memory techniques and things. Like that. And I said, anything on memory? Well, he gave me, he got three books on hypnosis. And I thought, oh, well, I'll be honest. I thought, oh, well, it's not really memory, but okay. And I'll put them to one side. Then I read them later. I became fascinated, absolutely fascinated with uh, hypnosis. And I trained and became a hypnotherapist uh, as well. So I became a hypnotherapist, not a vast hypnotherapist, then a trainer of hypnotherapy. Whilst you're still in the job? Yeah. Whilst you're still in the job. It, it was great. Then I, when I transferred to the city i i got permission to run my own business alongside uh, being a policeman and which they gave me permission for and they also trained me to be a stress counselor oh brilliant dr eric yeah dr eric shepherd because i've shown this oh, yeah. interest i don't even know of dr eric shepherd but he was uh, the military's lead interrogator at the time he was a as a man who could inflict stress, <laughs> yeah. uh, and I, with two others, trained with him and became a stress counsellor. Um, the city paid for me to be. You've heard of NLP, neuro linguistic programming? Yeah. So I, I became uh, a practitioner, master practitioner, and trainer of NLP as well. And I would deal with uh, guys for stress in the city. And all I had to do is report direct to the commissioner. I didn't have to deal wow. with intermediate ranks at all. So that there was a sort of hotline there was quite good. I had, while still in the city there, I had my business and I was renting local premises on as and when needed um, locally. And then I went into, got a clinic at number 10 Harley Street when I retired. So I left the police and, and went full time for myself. So working from Chelmsford, I converted a, a room at the house and had a clinic here, a number ten Harley Street, and I was invited to become a member of the Royal Society of Medicine. And whilst that, since then, I've become a, a life fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine. So, Pete, you just knocked me over. <laughs> you just not. Uh, you, you, look, I, I say this all the time. I, I never Google people because I just want them to unload their story and and tell me all. But that's a, amazing, mate. Uh, are you still practicing? I well, I was sort of semi-retired. Another golden step. Um, I decided to cut back a little bit <laughs> on the hypnosis stuff. Money as a result that Chris Cornell that I told you about. Yeah. I've been talking to him, and uh, he kept saying to me, Pete, will you come and cover? Will you come and do, uh, become a celebrant, a funeral celebrant? I said, no, no, no. I was, I was quite happy doing what I was doing. And anyway, he, over a number of years, he kept saying, please come along. I need someone who can stand up and talk and do the bits there. So in order to shut him up, to be perfectly honest, <laughs> and I told him this, I'll come along. And I went along to one of his services, I ended up going to 10 of his services. I loved it. I thought it was great. And I started doing funeral ceremony work. So I cut back. I stopped my Harley Street um, connection and then um, did more of the funeral celebrant. But I still do hypnosis. Though I sort of 
generally retired on that. I do it for family, friends, and you know, I still do a reasonable amount of PTSD work for people who need help. That's so, very, very good. That is very, very good. So looking after people with PTSD, I mean, that is absolutely brilliant. And I think if you go back to 1975, we didn't recognise PTSD within the police service. No, 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 not by any feat of the imagination then. And it, it, the the way of dealing with the stresses then, and it's still quite a, a very good thing because I've actually, I was invited to Port Cullis House to talk um, about uh, post-traumatic stress Um with the, uh, oh, I can see his face. Sorry, it was, it was one of the uh, prime ministers, but they they had a bit there. Um, the hot debrief is by far and away still one of the best things um, w- which we used to do. Yeah. You had you had, you had other thing there where we went back. Um, everyone would go back and have a drink, have a talk, and and talk out and. Yes, you you would rip into each other and have a laugh, but it was done with a, in a friendly way, not in a, not in a nasty way, and it allowed people to talk out their fears uh, and do the, uh, and say, you know, I was bricking myself, whatever. And, um, so, and we've all had fear, haven't we? I mean, if if you oh, yeah. if if you've never had fear whilst policing, then you haven't done the job. That that that's no. that's the thing, and. I'll hop back to a previous podcast where I talk about canteen culture and how the canteens and the bars made such a massive difference to the guys and girls that were doing the the, the day-to-day work. Yes, 100%. Uh, I, it's still needed. It's still yeah, needed. It is still bloody I think the, any finance that would involve in keeping it running, um, it would be far, far, far cheaper than the ongoing treatment that others need as a result of not receiving that mm. initial gathering, get together, safe place, safe place to go. Yeah, safe place, safe hands. And you knew if your mates were keeling over, if if the person who was the loudest became the quietest and their moods changed and the, you knew there was something wrong. Yeah. The skippers knew, the inspectors knew. You, you just got on with it. It was, it was the place to be, but... We'll see. We'll see what they do, government. And that's the other thing, mate. When you joined, when I joined, crimes have evolved to such a point where it's it's a completely different landscape. But those old crimes are still taking, with the exception of the theft of or the theft from meters and the other the other stuff. We, they're still yeah. getting theft of milk. I would imagine somewhere in the country where people have their milk delivered. Yeah. All all the other stuff that's still going on. So actually, the police service should have increased in size in order to deal with the current demand. But all that what they've done is they've built up a, a a layer of bureaucracy where you can't report a crime. No, no, which is quite. No, it's, it's, and and you haven't got the guys and girls going out there doing it. The Chelmsford used to benefit from the fact that headquarters had the traffic department and. The uh, the FSU going out yep. from there multiple times a day, in and out, in yep. and out, and that gave a presence out on the ground there. Yep. Um, the people on on shift walking out round the estates, the detached beats, uh, doing it. Yeah, untold amounts of crimes prevented, but also the fact that you were approachable and the the public would come to you and say. Uh, do you know about so and so? Have you seen this, or this, uh, were you aware of uh, the intelligence that came in in a in a subtle way? Yeah, and you you can't put a price on prevention, other than the cost of insurance, the cost yeah. cost of the homeowner, all the other collateral damage. That's the price, but that's lost on our PCC. What made you go to the NCS National Crime Squad? Um, it was really utilising my skills that I had. It was just I felt there was something else to go to and, and others were saying, come to us. And so I said, right, okay, time for a change of direction again. And I headed off. Crawley was the um, branch then to go to that I was invited to go to and 
I worked Crawley and then later on over to Hamel Hempstead office and worked on all sorts of crime and terrorism and bits and there. I mean, well, Crawley's yeah. quite a schlep from where you are. I mean, that's not a – because there would there'd have been – National Crime Squad would have been at Swanley as well. Yeah, yeah, go, went past them. <laughs> yeah, go past them and go, go to work. Yeah, yeah. What sort of stuff did you deal with? Well, it, it was very much the major organised crime with the um, – a lot of drug stuff, a lot, lot of big drug stuff and working – for a long time to get people that were um, importing and to get the whole chain rather than just the, the lower tier people, getting the, getting right the way through to the very top uh, and, and assisting with covert operations and that type of thing. So you're doing armed surveillance? or, or I didn't do armed surveillance, no. I, I, I was involved with it, but at that time I was... Um, we would do crops work and all sorts of things, and that's quite that's quite daunting, isn't it? I mean, cr- being a crop, and for those who don't know, you basically you go and live in a ditch or a hedge somewhere and uh, keep an eye on the baddies, don't you? And that's that's how the officer who was um, killed by Kenneth Noy, yeah. that, that's what he was doing. You know, he was looking out for the the gold, and um, Noy killed him. Yeah, and that's I yeah. mean that's that's a ter- and it's, that's a tough job. I said, so, but you used to get some very good equipment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you needed it, though. <laughs> you did need it. You did need the stuff there. Um, doing this. Yeah. I wonder if they still – I'm not so much crops. I'm not really – but I wonder if they still do the observations and where people sit, sit in a van for hours yes. on end. I wonder if they still do that or whether there's a, a, a technical way of doing it. I would imagine there's got to be, hasn't there? That. Yes, yeah, in both cases. Mm. Yeah, you, you've, you've got both the Mark One eyeball and uh, the remote uh, viewing, let's put yeah. it like that. Yeah, yeah, way. yeah, absolutely. But, uh, yeah. Which, is, which is another interesting part of the world. Did you enjoy your time on the NCS? I loved it. I loved it. And so much so. I got to the end of my, I finished my time in the job at the NCS, which was, which was the great thing. But to stay on um, wasn't viable because I got to the end of my 30 years anyway. And I, I was nicely asked if I'd go to MI5, um, but that would have meant more travel and being away from home a lot more. So... That, that was a, another thing. And I had the hypnotherapy, so yeah, yeah, I course. was doing that. That was time to change again uh, and do the bits there. But I, I went all over the country, around Europe. I went to Canada. I went to the States um, with the squad. So, um, yeah, it, it was good, interesting. Long hours, long bits. Um, but thorough. I've slept under every... Uh, bridge on the M25 that you can sleep under in a, in a car to get, to get home. Yeah. <laughs> and you have your 15 minutes drive on, another 15 somewhere just to get back. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. That, and, and people lose total sight of the, these pieces of work. They only they only look at the negative side. They don't look at the positive for, you know, the people that are keeping us safe every single day. Oh, oh no. They, they never and they're still that. keeping us safe, mate, whatever we may yeah. or may not think of them and, the, you know, the work they may or may not do, but they're still keeping us safe. But, of course, your life wasn't all about policing, was it? You know, you've got a sporting prowess. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm heavily involved with uh, canoe and kayak. Yeah, very much so. And, still? Uh, Still involved. Um, I, I'm i a qualified Olympic official and uh, for kayaking. And uh, I've been to well, Beijing, London and Rio as an official. And I went before that to Athens Olympics um, as a team member, support team member for the kayak squad. For GB How did you get Canary. into that? All started off with my sons. Uh, at the age of 12 and 13, they wanted to go canoeing, so we took them to Chelmsford Canoe Club, and we were welcomed. 
there, as did our people. But the, welcome the chair at the time, uh, Bill Cousins, come in. He took my lads and took them through and gave them all the basics. And he said, you you really should be a member here. And I was, why is that? He said, because you've got a Land Rover. <laughs> you can buy a trailer. <laughs> That was it. Uh, and we just got on well. Uh, we watched the boys uh, paddling, my wife and myself, Mo and myself. And we thought, well, we might as well paddle ourselves. We started paddling. Then we, to build, to make the numbers up, in all honesty, we went on a, a training course uh, to become canoeing uh, instructors, kayak instructors. And it just built the numbers up to so the event to be held qualified we started coaching and it sort of went from there it went higher and higher um my wife is very high in the uh, coaching world and i coached as well we went to nottingham and there at nottingham is with the national water sports center and we had sprint kayaking there which is 200 500 and 1000 meters which is the Olympic distances, and we just loved it. The whole place was pristine. It, it was just excitement and bits there. And they called out on the Ten Eyes. They wanted volunteers to help uh, be officials. So as my wife was running the team uh, from Chelmsford, I volunteered and became the represent Chelmsford representative, just doing uh, officiating. Built up from there. Uh, just doing the national events, uh, I was invited to go to, I had to go to Germany, study for it, but, but to become an international technical official, as they call it. And uh, I had to go to Germany, to Duisburg, and sit a, a written exam and an oral exam. Um, once qualified there, I then attended world cups um world championships and then uh, was invited to go to the olympics as i say i went to beijing in fact i qualified not only as a for a sprint canoe and as a olympic official but for as a slalom official as well for beijing and um i just kept doing it <laughs> and they promoted me from on the course uh, to I became the chief starter for the Olympics and internationals. How cool well. is that? Yeah. So you're you're that, a dark that horse. Might be going through all these different countries. Yeah. How cool! You honestly, the things that people do, and and again, these are these things are lost, aren't they? If, if we don't ask these questions, we never find out. So, what have you got planned now? I mean, you you've been poorly. You you you. I'm delighted to hear that your your cancers. Yeah, sorted. Um, can I ask what sort of cancer you had? Yeah, it was in the colon. I, I, in the colon, I had a tumor which uh, was four centimeters long, and the well, my initial bit was that I had um, I thought it was like indigestion, right? And um, for the first first time in life, I took Gaviscon. Say something. I thought, oh, I'll just take that. No, I didn't touch it. So I went to the doctors. They gave me some uh, stuff called omeprazole, and we'll put you in the system. And, and this worked. It didn't, no pain, but and I nearly stopped it and said, okay, well, you sorted it, but thankfully I didn't. Um, and I ended up having uh, uh, endoscopy and colonoscopy, and they found this tumour, and I got referred to the Royal Free at London, and the chap there said, well, we don't know whether it's cancerous or not, but it's got to come out. So, uh, right, okay. Um, put myself in their hands, as you do. Yeah. And they took out the tumour, which turned out to be cancerous, uh, but it took out my, um, my in my duodenum, which is the little bit of um, intestine coming just outside of the stomach, is almost a right angle immediately. And mm. I I had the blockage on the right angle, just like general plumbing. <laughs> um, so they, they took out the duodenum, uh, a third of my stomach, a third of my pancreas, and my gallbladder. Um, 
I asked for a surgeon with small hands. I think he must have been a labourer in a previous life, <laughs> <laughs> judging by the scar I've got at the middle of me. <laughs> um, must have scared the life out of you, though, Peter. Initially, yeah, I think any anyone who says, like talking about not being scared, you think, ah, oh, for me, the worst bit was actually saying to my sons, when I had the uh, colonoscopy, the... Um, I had to go to a recovery room and then go out to go and see the uh, the guy operating the uh, endoscope. And as I walked out to go and see him, my wife was walking the other way. And I thought, mm, why is she here? Mm. <laughs> this isn't good. Um, but that was – so I'd had that initial bit with Mo and then telling the boys. But not that. I thought, no, I did. No, be positive, you know. <laughs> um and, and just go through with it. And that's what I've had. I've had good treatment. I've had so many scans and tests of this. And then after three months after the actual operation, and I thought I needed all those bits to live, but, you know, obviously not. <laughs> they, uh, I started my chemotherapy, and they said, well, look, um, because you're fit um, and, and, and well, apart from that, you we're going to hit you hard with a – an initial boost, and, and then we'll have to, almost certainly have to drop it down. We'll see how it goes. Um, but they never did drop it and just had these treatments. One had to skip because my levels weren't right. But then on, and since then, that was six months of uh, good wax of chemotherapy. And now I am, now that was 27th of, 7th of July in 21, I had it, and now I'm cancer-free. And, in fact, I've just a few couple of months ago, they switched me from three-month scans to six-month scans Brilliant. because I'm still clear, which is nice. I've got a little bit of peripheral neuropathy in my hands and feet. I've got uh, this sort of numbness and tingles, which is a result of the chemo. And uh, that's going very, very slow. It might not go at all. The funny part was when I saw the consultant, he, um, he shook my hand and said, well done, you've beaten it. He's done there. And then the, the nurse said to me that was with him, and your hair will start to grow back now. <laughs> I said, well, yeah. She says, yeah. And I said, that would be great because it started falling out when I was 21. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate. That's inspirational, you know, because I just think we have so much – bad news about cancer and you know people that we love who, who got it and I, I can imagine that everybody that listens to this would have had somebody that's had it they may have it themselves but you know your positive outlook and and the outcome and i get it not everybody has it you know we're, we're police officers we're fatalists aren't yeah. we yeah but you know it is absolutely fantastic and I, I can't imagine how i would feel if a doctor walked out and said you know what you're all right. You're fine, you know, and it's just, it's just one of those things. So, what's gonna, what's Pete gonna do now? He, Pete, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm really, I'm helping out my boys. I'm, but the, uh, I've got two lads, which I said, um, Steve, the oldest, he's in the Met. He's a sergeant in the Met. Oh, fantastic! And, and my other lad, Keith, he's. Um, a director of a medical um, publishing company, uh, European Medical Journal in in the city, and we we just uh, they're busy doing bits. I, I very much into DIY type stuff. I typical dad stuff, and so I help them. You're talking to the wrong person about <laughs> DIY, mate. I, I, I couldn't cut a loaf of bread, let alone a piece of wood. <laughs> well, you, you might not sweat as much as I've been doing. <laughs> Or maybe you would. I don't know. I, I really don't know. Um, I like learning new things. I'm playing with bits. There's a, a system which I'm going to look to do later this year, which is called uh, photo reading, which is uh, dealing with um, being able to read 20, oh, so 25,000 words a minute. And uh, where you just encompass both pages at once there. Uh, that's 
and it's not reading conventionally, you absorb it all there. And that's a sort of 75, 80% comprehension. So I, I fancy doing a course on that and start doing photo reading. That's amazing. That's <laughs> I, it can be done. There's a, you, you look it up. In fact, there's a very good – people dismiss it because it's Darren Brown, but Darren Brown does a demonstration of it. If you go on YouTube and look up Darren Brown at British Library and see the full – program part of him he, he demonstrates the skill of using photo reading and i know some other guys that do it and you can um, well in fact one chap i know he doesn't buy books anymore he goes to likes of waterstones where they've got a, a coffee shop and he'll get a cup of coffee and he'll take a book off of the off the shelf and he'll read that in less than 20 minutes just flicking through taking in two pages at once every second, that type of thing. Oh, my and, life. Uh, it's uh, quite that's, a thing. That's, so, that's yeah. bonkers. Yeah, it is crazy. We, we're taught to sort of you read each word right the way through from youngsters. We look at each word individually and sound it in their mind. But you don't need to. You can absorb all the information. I mean, if you uh, most probably got the skill of actually reading upside down, if you – we all develop that for looking what the cross of governor's desk to see what's yeah, yeah. not <laughs> in there. Well, we can do that. You can read a book backwards and everything, and the, the mind will reorder it and put it into the right order for you. And it's um, it's not like conventional reading. You say you're absorbing the information and you just then develop it and know it. Uh, yeah, there, there was uh, someone else did it, a demonstration on a computer screen. So they, they read from a computer screen, photo reading, and it was 75,000 words a minute. It was like the, a waterfall in reverse. And they ended up, I think, was 70% comprehension of what had been uh, wow. played through the screen. We've got so much we can do. And, it, and, it, and that's without going on to Savants. If you look at Savants, the Kim... Um, can't think of his name now. The guy that was with the... the Inspiration for the Rain Man. Right, yeah. Yeah. He he could read both pages at once. His left eye would read the left page and his right eye would read the right page and take all the information and he would remember everything with that. Wait, yes, he, he, he was a savant. He had an impairment on the brain, but gave him extra skills there. Wow. Doing the bits, but could take it all in. So I, I quite like that. And learning more with it, I say, even though I retired in sort of semi-retirement from the, the hypno thing, I quite like learning and uh, updating, upskilling, that type of thing. I, I teach an advanced level on it still. So there's still there people to be helped, if you like. You must have had so much, when you were when you were training for this, you must have had so much fun with those lads on the FSU, trying to get them to take part in your... I can just imagine some of them. Did you did you try it out on them? I, I did. Some of the guys were happy to go along with it. Others ran out of the room immediately. Yeah, of course they did. Doing the bits there. So, yeah, yeah, we we uh, a oh. motley crew that gelled together. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great bunch of people. Well, Peter, I've really enjoyed today. Um, I've learned a lot about you. Um, but oh, before we conclude this interview, I'd like to give you the opportunity to add, alter, or correct anything that you've said in your statement today. <laughs> I'm lovable. <laughs> <laughs> Many a disagree. <laughs> Mate, I've really, like I say, I've really enjoyed it. And um, I'd like to thank Gary Edgerton for putting you up for this because uh, he is the man that stopped the Russians from moving down the high street in Brighton Sea, as he keeps telling everybody. Yeah, <laughs> he is indeed. <laughs> and he's deep, deep undercover. Oh, mate, he's, he's incredible. I'd like to get him on here, but he won't take, yes. he won't take part. He's, he's, he won't. No, he's, I'll have words with him. We'll have to have a go. He's now. scared. He's scared, you know, but then he's a Man United fan, so you'd expect him to be scared, wouldn't you? <laughs> he's got to be West Ham. You're going to support football. He's got to be West exactly. Ham. Exactly, and that's me as well, mate. Um, thank you so much. If there's anything you need, please get in touch. If you've got any friends that are in the celebrant world that have got a policing background, and I know that everybody's busy or if they've got their own businesses, we've got our ex-job services and people can put their businesses on there free of charge. 
and um, there is a paid side to it if people want to add their YouTube links because you have to pay for bandwidth and things like that. Yeah. But the initial entry is free of charge, and it's basically a repository for really nice people who have, you know, former police or military that have got their own businesses. So if, you've, right. if you know, I'll send you the links. If you know send anyone, the then, um, you know, please share it around because I want to try and build it into. You well, you've know, got likes of Glenn Mays um, in Chelsea, if you know Glenn. Yeah, I know Glenn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and, you know, but but yeah. it's that connection, you know, so that I've got, I've got a couple of celebrants and Toastmasters on there, but it's building that bigger piece because it doesn't cost them anything. But it, no. but it gives – well, you see how pro- prolific I am on social media. I mean, it, yeah. it, I must drive you all bloody mad. But um, no, it's, it's good. It's, it's, no, I, I, find, I think it's fun. It's yeah, like, yeah, it is fun. Learning, in fact, you've, you've got me <coughs> – I suppose now you've – piqued my interest on whether to do a podcast at some stage. And, well, yeah. You know, to, to do some other bits on there with the canoeing world. But um, you could do it on hypnotherapy. I'm not being funny, mate. The, yeah. The, you, if, I'll, I will ha- happily help you and guide you on it. I can I can. Well, go- I've done, I've done like, say, part of my hypnotherapy was it, uh, did a lot of sports peak performance stuff. And I've had people... Um, I've had to sign lots of uh, non-disclosure of course. Uh, arrangements with, with people there. Uh, one of the best, my best one I had was a guy who was competing in India, flew in to see me at Harley Street, saw me, flew out, went back to India and won. Um, Brilliant. The competition. It was absolutely marvellous on that. But I can't say who it was. No, 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 of course. The bit I had was the fact that Harley Street, we had a back door where people could come in and out without being seen Same, for yeah. celebrities and uh, things like that. So um, lots of um, peak performance stuff. I've had world champions and, and bits of that, people going up there. Although they haven't, for obvious reasons, they don't want to be identified um, in any way, shape or form because they've got the upper edge. Yeah, absolutely. So but They the- perceive it and do that. But there's certainly... Lots of things that uh, could be done on that and talks on it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. All right. But I'll, I'll help you. I'll help you. It's not a problem. You be safe. Don't work too hard. Yeah. Remember, in ancient times when people beat the ground and swore, it was called witchcraft. Today, they call it golf. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, mate. God bless you. you and too, I, mate. I'm glad you... that you're keeping well. And you be safe. Bye. Cheers. Bye bye. Thanks ever so much for listening to this episode of Paul Maleri's X Job Downloaded. Please like, follow, and share with all your friends. Your support is absolutely invaluable and makes a real difference to me as a podcaster. Thank you.